Hey everybody, this is my second interview with Ronald Savage. The first one was earlier in July, but there was way too much street noise. So Ronald granted me and a this is considered a do-over. Just consider this a do-over in October. You'll hear me kind of reminding him of what we discussed in the previous interview. So it's not our first sit down. Thank you. So let's talk about why you're not talking about it anymore. You had mentioned um, that you're uh, that you wanted to get back on track, and mm -hmm. that this was not like your regular life. Um, yeah, my reasons that I'm not talking about it um, no more is, you know, when I first came out, I didn't expect all of this. I I honestly didn't. Um, my whole thing was it. I just exploded, and at that particular time, I just had to get it out. It was something that was boiling inside of me from little to now and the way it came out is the way it came out but I didn't expect media and if I, I didn't for the life of me I didn't know that it would be this extreme and the reasons that I'm not talking about it now is because now I'm getting the much needed therapy that I've been needed when I was younger you know I didn't start getting therapy into maybe like a few months and then even after when this came out and my thing is that you know people can tell you xyz that you should go about a certain situation this way or that way but the best people that can tell you how to overcome a traumatic situation like this is your doctors you know because my doctors now they have me on two different type of depression pills and my doctors, for the record, my doctors is the ones that don't want me to talk about this. Because they're like, you can never heal yourself or get over this if you're putting stuff on, sense on, on social media. It needs to be in a setting with doctors and stuff so that you have your therapist and you have your psychiatrist. And that's what I'm having. I see my, um, my therapist every two weeks and I see my psychiatrist every week. And with my therapist, the things that I want to say to social media stuff, I say to my, my therapist. And she's the one that sits and listens to me. And it, it's better that way. And she gives me, I, you know, what, what should be done because she went to school for this, you know? So that's, and, and, and I tell everyone, if you've ever had a traumatic experience like I have, if you've ever been molested or raped, keep that stuff off of social media and definitely go see a, um, a, a doctor, you know, a therapist, psychiatrist, because that's the best way to go. Okay, so just do a small segment because you didn't mention uh, nobody's, well, nobody paid you off, but let's- Oh, I thought that was gonna be a separate- um, Yeah, yeah, so I'm gonna tie it into Okay, so in the, before you were describing how this last year has been, meaning how you've all been on guard since it happened. Right. You could talk about how, you know, when TC got murdered, how did you feel at that time? And we had talked about you feeling like at that time you were under an imminent threat. Mm -hmm. And then I think you could tie it into that, but that's not why I stopped talking because I didn't get any money or whatever. Um. So talk about how this last year has not been like your normal life. Um, this last year, you know, has been not me, not my normal life. You know, I really want to go back to my normal life. It's, you know, when, when I'm going to work and stuff, I have to go one way one day and then another, another day the next day. And I always have to look over my shoulder. I never had to go through that, you know? and um, I, this last year is if I can do it all over again I I don't know <laughs> you know and 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 people you know I mean from certain people I haven't had any threats I've only heard from other people to say you know what well, this person said XYZ you know but when people tell you that you're always on guard so I'm I'm always on guard and I know the type of people that that they are from when I was younger, so I'm gonna be extra on guard. And you know, I, you know, I always have to worry about my kids, my family, and it, it's really not cool. And 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 to hear people say that um, that I got paid off. No, don't say to hear people say. Just say 
you just say I'm, it. I'm just gonna Be get to that. Okay, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but this is a documentary. It's not Facebook or YouTube. So, oh, oh, don't okay. even acknowledge these rumors. We're oh. we're, we're having a mature conversation okay. about this. All right. If you've um, heard from his attorney or anything like yeah, that. Yeah. Um. And um, the thing is, when this first came out, all the way up until now, I never heard from Bam's attorney. Um, never spoken to him. Never, never met him, ever. You know, um, I've never gotten paid off. Um, I've never asked for no money. That's not what this was about. I was never seeking money, never seeking anything, you know? Never had a payday. Um, but what I did, what I did have was um, people, Zulus offering me money, coming, and they said it was coming from him offering me money to keep silent um and like i told them and you can you know that's not what this is about you know and that's why i, I kept on going forth with it because it never was about money and to this day it's still never about money i have not seen nothing you know and the reasons um i don't talk about it is like i said you know it's because i'm getting the much needed therapy that I needed. And to sit there and keep dwelling on a situation, you're never gonna recover. Okay, let's, this is gonna be the last one along this line. Let's talk about um, the statute of limitations. And you have talked about why you think others don't speak out when this has happened to them. Um, you know, there's a thing when I, when I first was um, speaking about this, even up until now, um, I'm, I'm waiting for the new year to start um, because when I first came out, it was in the in the beginning of the year, and I had joined up with a group that was um, fighting for the statute of limitations, and the Daily News had um, hooked me up um, with that group um, that was fighting for the statute of limitations, and um, uh, you know I, I have a lot of friends. Um, and politics that was dealing with the um, with the situation because you know I'm a former elected official. I'm a, a, a former member of the New York State Democrat Committee. So you know that whole process and the people that they were dealing with, it was nothing new to me. It was like family, you know. Um, and there's a thing called statute of limitations for those who don't know what statute of limitations is, is that you have a certain amount of years or time to bring forth a situation like, you know, being molested. Here in New York State, you have up until 21 to bring that to the attention of uh, law enforcement and, um, and, and, and the law. And once you get past the age of 21, Legally, there's nothing that no one can do about it because it's 21 passed. or 23. Sorry to interrupt. 23. You. Okay, I'm sorry. so say, say that 23. here in New York State. Okay, here in New York State, um, the statute of limitation law is up until 23, and when you get 20, when you get past 23 years old, there's nothing that no one can do about it because it passed that the the law that was set up until you can bring forth a situation of you being molested when you are a child. And that's the same as monetary. Um, you cannot bring this forth in a court past the age of 23 years old in New York State. And we were trying to get the law changed. Um, we were trying to get uh, the, the statute of limitations done away with so that there will be no statute of limitations. But, um, and you know, we're going to keep fighting that fight. Um, it almost made it to the, to the floor of the New York uh, Senate. Um, it passed the State Assembly. The State Assembly um, passed their bill, um, but it didn't uh, hit the floor for the, uh, for the New York Senate. And come um, next year, we're, we're going to still fight that fight. I'm still on board with the fight. But right now, um, as far as Albany goes, the elected officials, they're not in Albany. So we can't fight the, the fight that we were fighting until they go back to Albany, till they're all together, you know? And once they're back all together and they're listening to bills that 
people went past, then that's when we'll go up and, um, and, and fight our fight again. And hopefully this time they'll, they'll, they'll change the law. You know what we didn't ask before? How, how was it as, like Lord Jamar described you as, I'm gonna do something while I'm asking this question. Mm -hmm. He described you as an intern at uh, Jazzy J's studio. So can you talk about those days? I mean, as a kid, I would imagine you were having fun, but plus this strange thing was going on or whatever. Let me just plug this in before we begin. Get uh, the records that were on Strong City slash MCA records played in the clubs and on rap radio. So we had uh, artists like Masters of Ceremony, which is a grand pooba. Um, uh, we had uh, the chief rocker Busy B. We had Ice Cream T. We had a whole bunch of um, art recording artists that was um, on Strong City Records. And my job was to bug the DJs to play the records, and that's what I did. I used to call like like DJ Chuck Chill Out. He, to this day, he probably still not talking to me because I used to wake him up at 6 a.m. in the morning talking about, "Are you gonna play Busy B?" <laughs> he like is this beast thing up, click. <laughs> Big shout out to Chuck Chill Out. You know, like Red Alert and all the DJs are, are, are across the United States, I used to bug like that. You know, so it, it, I, I really, I really loved um, that job. It was a real good experience. Um, the only times when um, I really didn't like Strong City and um, when I always felt on guard was when um, Africa Bam Bada showed up. Cause Bam used to come to the studio and stuff. And you know, I, I would have flashbacks and you know, my whole thing was I would just be like, oh, I wish he hurried and leave. I was older then, because I knew he wasn't gonna try nothing then. But it's just that the remembrance of him doing what he did was still there. That's something that will never go away. You know, um, you know, I, I was with the Zulu Nation and, and stuff like that. And, um, but during that time, you know, I really didn't know who, who to tell at that time. You know, so I never, from the time, from 15 years old up until, you know, the times of Strong City days, I had never really told none of the Zulus, but I had told personal friends of mine, like people that lived in my building, and um, Jazzy J's little brother, um, a, a couple of people I had told. And um, after I left Strong City Records, um, I was very happy because then I didn't have to be around that setting anymore. Um, when I was younger, going to the parties and stuff, you know, I never really, I never really enjoyed the parties to say like really enjoyed it. Um, I would be on stage with Jazzy and when Bambada came to the stage, I would leave. So people probably would figure like, you know, why I, I, I left, always would leave the stage when, when he's around because I did not want to be around that man because I knew what was taking place behind the scenes. And the reason I didn't enjoy the parties is because my whole frame was looking around the parties wondering who else was he doing this to you know and anybody that would sit there and laugh and joke around with bam and my mind would be like oh wow he's probably doing that to them too so i didn't really get to enjoy you know the the the, the hip-hop the way um i supposed to have joined hip-hop and you know these days um when it was in the 90s, so I'm gonna fast forward to the 90s when Public Enemy and Queen Latifah had came out, Traco Quest and everybody, you know, that was a thing called hip hop movement. That was a, a, a movement that they were involved in. And um, that was something that I enjoyed, especially Public Enemy, because at the time I really didn't like to call hip hop, hip hop culture because with the culture, it stands for pedophilia to me, you know? And it represented a cult to me. That's how I felt. And um, I liked calling hip hop the hip hop movement. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what they called it. And that was something that I can relate, the madness of public enemy, because I've always questioned, Not, I don't wanna say, I questioned my manhood. I always questioned myself, why did I allow this man to do this to me? You know, and the reason I say I questioned my, my, my manhood back then is because with relationships, I never liked to, I couldn't hold hands. I didn't like the way it felt. 
um, I didn't like to to hug. You know, I I didn't like to show int intimacy when I was with the female. But that was something that I was always into was females. But I didn't know how to show the love the way a man's supposed to show love. The way I showed love was buying the girl things. You know, that was my way of showing them um, that I loved them. And you know, to snuggle in the bed, I missed out on stuff like that. You know, and I know that um, you know it kind of hurt the females because you know you hear you're with this man and he doesn't even hold you in bed and stuff like that you know and um you know every female that i was with i told them that africa bambada molested me when i was younger so they understood but i don't know if they fully understood to where i couldn't hold hands or snuggle and stuff and it always bothered me and i've always in privacy in the bathroom or in privacy always cried you know and um you know that's why these days now um once all of this came out and stuff and i was back into the hip-hop thing and i had the hip-hop people um, um calling me um back in the 90s when i was on tour with a group called snap they made the record i got the power you know um to me they was part of the hip-hop movement also that whole that whole movement and back back then i had carved um the six the the elements the six elements of the hip hop movement because I didn't like the elements that Africa Bambada did. I never even, this you cannot even see, there's nothing of me ever speaking about those elements because I don't like it. I don't like it. You know, so I had to, see people, when you molested, you have to understand, like I had to do something that I felt comfortable of saying and wanted to be a part of. And that's why I, I carved those elements back then and this is why you see it now because I refuse to allow myself to be a part of something that this man has created. And that's why when I was, when I was, um, when I got the opportunity to leave uh, uh, Strong City Records, I left with the quickness. Because I, not to say I didn't want to be a part of Jazzy, I love Jazzy J, he's like a brother to me. But I didn't want to be a part of Africa Bambada coming around, you know. So that's why I, and then, you know, that's why I, 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 served, I did my research and stuff and no one had trademarked hip-hop movement, you know. So I went and I trademarked hip-hop movement because I had an organization which was United Coalition Association. So I, would, I changed the name to Hip Hop Movement and I trademarked it. So now when, when, when I am a part of Hip Hop, I like to say Hip Hop Movement because now I'm changing what the whole thing means. It doesn't mean what they meant. It's something that now that I'm creating something, this is my second chance to enjoy Hip Hop the way I was supposed to have enjoyed it when I was younger. You know, TC, said Bee Stinger's case is one that really pisses me off because it's like man why you ain't say nothing man like this right. is what he told me right but what what do you think would have been the response from someone like a TC mm -hmm. um, back then mm -hmm. if you know what do you think would have been the response of any of the guys if you did say anything um I think the response would have been something totally than what the response is now you know, like the TC Islams, um, uh, like other people who come to me now and say, why didn't I say something when I was younger? Um, it's funny because if I would have said something when I was younger, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now. You know, um, back then in the 70s, the Zulu Nation was strong, very strong. And when you said something against Africa Bambada, you didn't say it anymore. You know, and TC Islam, you know, and everyone else, you know, they really wanted to know why, you know, I really didn't um, speak about it. Because when I was at Bam's house, when he had me go up to his house, when he molested me, um, there was a photo book that was on the bed. And when I opened the photo book, certain people that I hung out with, with the Zulu Nation, was in that photo book holding their private parts, taking it out and stuff like that. Then you wonder why I didn't tell you what happened to me. How could I? I thought they all were a part of that. 
that's what I thought. I mean, if you see a photo book and people holding the pirate pots and then this man is having you masturbate in his house and telling you that it's okay for a guy to masturbate. So to me, everyone in that book masturbated in front of Bam. That's how I took it. So of course I wasn't gonna say nothing, you know? And to make matters worse, my sister's ex-boyfriend was in that photo book. And under, the, under his name, it said the biggest penis in Bronx River. So to me, to see that at a young age, who was I gonna tell? We're gonna come right back to that. But so if you were, I'm, cause I'm still thinking of you in Jazzy J studio. Now, how did, how, did, how did you feel when you heard him say that he don't even know you? Like if you were in there asking DJs to call, you know, calling to play mm -hmm. the, the records. How, remember when he said, I don't even know him. Yeah. <laughs> When Bam, when, when, when Africa Bambada, when he said that he didn't know me, I laughed because I knew that wasn't going to last very long because when you, in the streets, when you think of Eastinger, you think of Africa Bambada in the Zulu Nation. So it was just a matter of time before people would have said something. And this is why um, with Ahmed Henderson, I, I want to thank, publicly thank Ahmed Henderson for going on Star and saying that Africa Bambada lied, that he does know Beastinger. And for those who don't know who Ahmed Henderson is, Ahmed Henderson was the manager for Africa Bambada and the manager of the Zulu Nation. <laughs> okay, so you already brought up the, the photo book. Um, the last time we talked, I wanted you to describe certain ways that he groomed you before that time. And okay. you had mentioned, okay, you remember, or do you want me to refresh? I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, back then, I didn't really understand what grooming was. I didn't understand that I was a prey, his prey. Um, it's funny, it's funny because I just ran into a few people from Bronx River and they told me, yo, back in the days we was, we was upset with you because you always used to be able to be in the car with Bam. You always used to go everywhere with Bam Bada. We didn't like you, you know, and you wasn't even from Bronx River. You was from Castle Hill, you know, so that was Bam's way of getting me used to him, I guess for him to strike and even after he striked. Um, every time we went to the parties, I was always in Bambada's car. You know, um, he had a driver called, uh, I believe his name was 44, it was an OJ driver. You know, I used to be in the car with him, you know, with Bam. Anytime we go, I always ended up with Bam. And, you know, I would be there with Bam and Bam would pet my head like this. And that's why I don't, I don't, to this day, I don't like that. You know, he will always he, he he will always do that, and I just oof, like I don't I don't like people to touch my head. You know, he would do stuff like that. Um, when we finished with the parties and stuff, um, he would buy uh, he would buy us White Castle's hamburgers. White Castle's hamburgers was how we got paid, how the Zulu Nation got paid um, for the parties and stuff, and to get um, a shake, a vanilla shake, you had to be special. And I always got a vanilla shake. You know, I thought it's because oh, Bam likes me. You know, I'm getting a vanilla shake. You know. Ugh. I think you said that your parents had broken up. Like, do you remember how old you were when your parents broke up? And you also said that he had gained your parents' trust. Yeah. Um. You know, this was when my when my sister and um and uh, other females in my in my building um they all were dating members of the Zulu Nation and Bam used to come around with them. And um, you know, Bam met my parents and you know, my parents, they liked him because at, at the time he was doing something um, positive in, in their eyes of playing the music and taking kids off the street and having an, an activity which was hip hop to be a part of. So he actually gained the trust of my parents because um, prior to us meeting them, 
we can never really leave the projects. As far as that we can go is to the front of our building and in the park. That was as far as that we can go in my parents' eyes until, you know, we tried to sneak away. But, you know, that was, that was what we can do and we could not leave Castle Hill projects. So, you know, to have Bam and them come and that was like the Zulu Nation to come into my life, to come into my parents' eyes, it was, it was like someone answered my prayers that I can leave the project, you know? So, you know, my parents didn't mind me being with them, you know? They didn't mind not one bit. Not knowing after a time that Bam would come to my house when they weren't home. And um, Bam, you know, he would have me perform sex acts as far as um, him um, making me go down on him or me going down on him and he would tell me that it was okay. You know, I Or felt, him going down on you. Yeah, Bam going down on me and me going down on Bam both ways and he would tell me that it was okay you know I felt it kind of funny doing it because I knew it was wrong but how can you tell them no that's how I felt I felt if I would have told him no that something would happen to me he used to he he used to have me cross my legs and um have his penis in between my legs I would have to cross my legs and he would hump up and down on me this big man on me you know and um you know that was what was taking place while my parents were at home and that's why I look back now and say okay that's why I was able to ride with Bam all the time and get vanilla shakes and stuff like that you know um and him patting my head because to him I was Probably like his chick or something. I don't know, you know, like, you know, and 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 it's funny because even growing up, I've never the seen Bam with a female. God. God. Never seen Bam with a female, ever. Now, can you just state state were you how old you were? Even if it was as soon as the grooming, and he would have been he's eight years older than you. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So just say I was such and such age when this started, and, and he, he had to be 20s. about such and such. You don't have to go real, real long right. on that one. Okay. Um, I say I was um 15 years old, and I say Bam was in his 20s, maybe 26 or something to that to that nature, 27. I'm not really sure on on his particular age. Um, but around that time, my, um, my parents had, uh, had uh, broke up and, um, um, you know, my, my father was no longer um, in the house. So I guess that was another way of him being able to do what he did because, you know, I looked at Bam like the substitute of my father, you know, as the man figure um, around me because I always, I, I was always with him. So to him, to me, he was like a father figure. One more thing on this crime part, <clears throat> and that is that, uh, and you don't have to describe each incident unless you want to, but can you talk about how there, on several occasions there would be other males involved? Um, as far as other males, there was the very first incident when I first went to Bam's house and Bam um, told me that I can watch TV in his bedroom. And when I went to his bedroom, uh, the photo book was on the bed, and I would look through the photo book and I would see people that I know in the photo book exploiting their private parts. And Bam came into the room and he seen me looking at the book. And he asked me, did I know how to masturbate? And I was like, masturbate, what is that? I didn't, I didn't know what he was talking about. So long story short, he ended up showing me how to masturbate and he told me that it's okay because everybody does it. So as I'm doing, as I'm doing this, um, Bam left the room and there was another guy that was in the living room who was DJing with Bam. He came into the bedroom with his penis already out. And as soon as he came into the room, I got off that bed and I jetted, I jetted out, that, out that house and I started running. And I remember running 
and then I remember a lady pulling pulling over and me getting in the car and I remember me crying and she asked me what, what was the matter and I, I was scared to tell her um, what happened and she was trying to get out of me what happened and I just asked her if she could drive me back to my school. Um, you know, that was the first experience that I, that I had um, with another uh, male of them making me, trying to make me do something. Um, the second time was with my sister's boyfriend. Um, Bam had just finished picking me up and um, he asked me if I can go with him to my sister's boyfriend. This was after an occasion that me and him had did. And I wanted to go home, but when he said, you know, we're going to my sister's boyfriend's house, I'm like, okay, this won't happen, you know? We went to my sister's boyfriend's house and in the living room, um, Bam made me go down on my sister's boyfriend. And it was for a couple of seconds and my sister's boyfriend stopped. And then I remember him saying, no, not in front of Beast thing of, you know, why you have Beast thing of doing this and that stuff. And they went into the kitchen. I don't know what they were talking about, but I wanted to go, I wanted to leave. And I told them that I wanted to go home and he drove me home. Those were the only two incidences um, that I was around with Bam, but other people. How, how many years older do you do you think your sister's boyfriend was? Um, I believe he was two years older than me. Okay. Okay. So we all, and, uh -huh. and 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 it's funny because when I bring that up now to other people, um, they say that I shouldn't hold anything against my sister's boyfriend because he was a victim also. He was underage. We don't know. But yeah. I got you. Okay, so we're one more thing. All right. Now you had described, which I thought was really good, mm -hmm. um, when or why you came out, and you had discussed that you, how you felt God's presence, and you okay. have never felt it since then. And the last part was of that is if this was the last year before you died, kind of thing, and that's right. why you spoke. Okay. Um, it's funny because. Um, before I came out, I was just, I was thinking about all the um, incidents of me with, with, with my girlfriends. How my girlfriends, every girl that I had would say the same thing, that I didn't know how to show intimacy, I didn't know how to show love and stuff. And during that time, I had just finished breaking up with another girl who had said the same thing. So this was a pattern of, from the time I was younger all the way up, to uh, what was two years ago that this happened and um it was like i just started crying and i just started thinking about everything that 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 bam done to me and i just started tweeting it was like i felt i felt a presence and the presence that i felt and nobody cannot tell me that that wasn't god that was God's presence that was there with me. And I just kept tweeting that Bam Bada molested me. It was like, I just had to get it out. And with each tweet, I would cry. And that presence, it just gave me the strength to do what I did. Because if I never would have felt that type of presence, I don't think that I ever would have did that. And I, I can't even explain I can't even I can't even explain the presence but I know that that presence was God because I've never felt that presence ever again I've never felt that presence in my life and after that I've never felt that presence again me I'm a strong believer of God um, I, I walk with God I talk to God every day he's my friend but that presence of God I had never felt before until that day and I've never felt that presence again and you had said that if this was the last year uh... um no I mean the, the situation with me coming out and telling people what happened to me I made a promise to myself when I was younger when this first was happening to me I made a promise to, to myself that before I die I'm going to tell the world what happened to me, what this man did to me, and I made good on that promise. <laughs> Very good. Thank you.
Let me stop the audio. Thank you. Yeah, you